you very much. Um, I think this is going to be a very interesting session on uh, heart disease in women. And without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce the first speaker whom we've heard in a great talk yesterday, Martha Gulati, uh, MD, Fellow of the American uh, College of Cardiology, Fellow of the American Heart Association, um, uh, Editor-in-Chief of CardioSmart, and Division Chief of Cardiology and Professor of Medicine at the College of Medicine in Phoenix, University of Arizona. And she's going to uh, give the special lecture of heart disease in women, Dr. Gulati. Well, thank you again for having me. Now I get to talk about my favorite topic about women and heart disease. And I'm going to talk about, try to convince you, hopefully, that there is really a sex difference. So let's start, let's go back to the ancient Greeks, because the ancient Greeks really already at that point understood that men were different than women. And when they appointed a god of health, they actually were smart enough to also appoint a goddess of women's health who is known as Hygiena. So you know the staff with the snake that represents medicine? Well, Hygiena brought the snake. Women are always associated with the snake. But there is a lot of differences between men and women, and, and I'm going to give you a few examples. Here's one. This is how we see ourselves. And there's also differences between men and women about how we communicate. I have a weird sense of humor. I'm just going to admit that up front. When men say hi, apparently all they mean is hi. When women say hi, we mean so much more than hi. But there is the, let's get to the heart of the matter. And heart disease has been a, you know, an issue. Since the 80s, we've had been seeing in the United States more deaths in women compared with men. And it's only really in the last decade that we have made substantial decreases in mortality from cardiovascular disease. What's concerning though, when you look at these survival curves for the United States, when you look at these uh, death rates, sorry, due to cardiovascular disease, you can see in the last three years though, we have started seeing an upsurge where we had been making good reductions in mortality in men, shown in blue, and women shown in red, we now are seeing both of the death rates rising from cardiovascular disease. This may be the first generation that doesn't outlive its parents. And so that we're seeing it particularly in younger patients, which is really concerning us. And it's, it really is now a trend after these three years of data. For women specifically, after they have a heart attack, they do the, less, the least well. And the question is always why? And Dr. Nanette Wanger, who's my mentor and friend, and really I'd consider her the mother of cardiovascular disease in women, said this in the late 90s. She said, the medical community has really viewed women's health with a bikini approach, essentially discussing the breasts and the reproductive system and almost ignoring the rest of a woman when we talk about women's health. She said that in the 90s, and more recently, I wrote an editorial saying that when are we going to move beyond the bikini? Because still, when you look at women's health, we still focus essentially on those same systems and not enough about the heart. In the United States, we have 1.2 million deaths in 2016, the last point of our statistics statistics. And over 400,000 of the deaths in women are due to cardiovascular disease, making it the number one killer of women. The second leading cause is chronic lung disease. The third leading cause accounting for about 70,000 deaths is lung cancer. And the fourth leading cause in the United States is breast cancer, accounting for about 40,000 deaths. Yet women often are very well aware of the risk of breast cancer and are very good about getting screening for that. For heart disease, if you take a room of women, usually they will tell you their heart has not been assessed. Despite, again, just the numbers there show that it's the number one killer. We could even talk about prevalence, and we mentioned that yesterday that over half of people in the United States are living with some form of heart disease, and it's 44.7% in women. 
And the prevalence of breast cancer is about 3.5 million in the United States compared to the 60 million living with some form of cardiovascular disease. In Jamaica, the type of cardiovascular disease that is more prevalent in women tends to be stroke than, than coronary artery disease. Diabetes is obviously a huge issue in this country and hypertension. I'll show you some of the statistics I could find. I actually couldn't find the death rate specifically by women for Jamaica by looking at a number of different sources. One of the reasons women have notoriously done poorly after cardiovascular disease is that we didn't really include them in a lot of our trials. And that is a major issue. And this cartoon sort of depicts it. It's kind of funny, except it's so true. We have studies of fruit flies, mice, hamsters, frogs, monkeys, and men with this condition. But medical research using women as subjects just never really occurred to anyone. And that, sadly, you even heard it today that it would be more costly to include, do, do study by both sexes. And that's led to a lot of delays in us getting answers. Now, when we look at trials in cardiovascular disease and we look by, based on prevalence and if women are represented, we've made some headway in the last decade. In atrial fibrillation, we have gotten more women enrolled in trials where it really is proportional for the number of people living with the disease in the United States. Hypertension as well. Pulmonary hypertension as well. We've enrolled a fair number of women so that we can make some we can make statements related to women and cardiovascular disease for those conditions. But when you look at things like acute coronary syndrome, coronary artery syndrome, heart failure, the commonest diseases in men and in women, we still have an underrepresentation of women based on the prevalence of the disease in the population. Now, when I talk about sex differences, I'm not talking about gender. Sex, I'm talking about the biological differences, and I just want to be clear on that. But of course, when we're talking about women, we're talking a little bit about sex and a little bit about gender, because there is things about gender that make other parts of our lives different than compared to men. The lifestyle, access to care, access to insurance, poverty or wealth can be influenced by being a woman compared to a man. And where you live and how you live, of course. But biology, of course, there are differences between men and women just based on XX and XY. And remember, every cell has a sex. So there is sex differences. And I'm gonna try to point out some of the things related to gender and some of the things related to sex. So let's just ask ourselves if we even treat women like we treat men. If we just followed the guidelines, would, woman, would women get everything that men get? Well, the, sadly, the answer is no. If we look in the US at our data, the get with the guideline data, that which the American Heart Association collects this data, you're, it's voluntary, it comes from some of the best hospitals in the United States, even there we see differences between men and women. When we look at the adjusted odds ratio, the middle column here, if, it's gr if the odds ratio is greater than one, it means women are more likely to have it. If it's less than one, women are less likely to have it compared to men. And if it's equal to one, it means women and men get it equally. Well, you don't see a lot of ones, do you? Odds ratio of after having a myocardial infarction of getting aspirin or beta blocker within 24 hours, it's less likely if you're a woman compared to a man. In terms of revascularization, less likely if you're a woman compared to a man. Meeting the door to balloon time, the door to needle times, which are measures that we have that are there to help us see how quickly we're treating people, again, less likely if you're a woman compared to a man. The only thing women are better at doing compared to men is dying. And again, for ST elevation myocardial infarction, that's where it's most likely. This is older data, but we've looked at it more recently, and we continue to see the same trends. It's still worse to be a woman, and particularly in the United States, worse to be a black woman, more likely to have bleeding, which has been a longstanding issue related to both our treatment of cardiovascular disease as well. So we, we do have a long way still to go. If we would just follow guidelines, again, we could probably narrow this gap. We even use the get with the guidelines data to look at 
by age, because we are concerned about the youngest women more, being more likely to die. And here we stratified by under the age of 45 to compare to those over the age of 45 who had an ST elevation myocardial infarction. And in fact, there's really no difference, to be honest, except there's less women under the age of 45 having a heart attack, so the confidence interval is wider, but the same thing was found. It was just worse to be a woman they were less likely to receive an ACE inhibitor or an ARB after a, a ST elevation myocardial infarction. You were less likely to receive lipid lowering therapy. You were less likely to leave the hospital with controlled blood pressure. I don't know the reason for that. And again, the door to balloon time, door to needle time were less likely to be achieved in women compared to men. We've seen this in younger women, too. So this is the Virgo study that looked at women under the age of 55 compared to men under the age of 55 to see if there was a difference in treatment. And these are people who all had an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Now, when they saw, that, you know, the door to, door to balloon time were to meet under 90 minutes, and they were achieving that in both men and women under the age of 55 if they did PCI in their hospital. But there was an eight-minute longer treatment for women compared to men. Now, if they were transferred from a hospital, there was a greater delay, and it was more than 30 minutes, and it didn't meet the standard of 120 minutes if you come from an outside hospital. Neither of these translated into higher mortality rates I'll do in the Virgo trial, probably because these are some of our better hospitals as well, but at least it does answer a little bit that younger people, younger women are treated less aggressively, at least in a timely manner. We have data about rehospitalization too for younger women specifically compared to younger men. The rehospitalization after a myocardial infarction is much higher in younger women. It is also higher in older women, but not the gap is not as great compared to the same age men. So the younger, on this slide, you can see the gray lines depict women, the black lines depict men, and the younger people are depicted by the solid lines. Now there is approaches to try to improve this by having a system-based approach, and this is one study where they put in four steps. Blue, the blue bars are showing what happened before they put in this approach and say, showing that men did better if it's above the line than men. I mean, sorry, men did better than women. But when they put in the four-step approach, which was a standard checklist for passing off, especially in our emergency rooms that do you know, work in shifts and people trade off, you've got to know what other people have done, that there was a handoff list, there was an immediate transfer to a cath lab if they didn't do cath in their own hospital, and also a radial approach, because women specifically have, tend to have less bleeding if we do a radial approach. You can see in the red bars, after these were implemented, where this checklist was all in place and they did follow the protocol, it still didn't become equal for women, but women did better. There was less of a gap between men and women. And actually, one thing they did see was that stroke was less when they did this in women compared to men. So there is reasons to think that, you know, making a standard way of how we approach myocardial infarction could change it if we just could be a little less biased to whether it's male or whether it's female. And so I wrote this editorial last year saying that you know some of the things that we need to do to improve outcomes after STEMI is really both educating women, educating healthcare providers, because there's still a lot of bias in how we treat women, as I will show you, and implementing these standard protocols, which will help. Artificial intelligence may help, and I'm gonna show you an example of using AI in, in terms of reducing bias. And then also, of course, we need more research to understand these disparities in care. So the other question that I have for you today is whether women experience cardiovascular disease like men. And there's often this notion that women present atypically, and in fact, you know, there's this syndrome called Yentl syndrome. It was coined by Bernadine Healy, the first woman to lead the National Institute of Health. And she noted these disparities between men and women, especially inclusion of women in trials. 
And so her point was by saying, there's a story of Yentl. Yentl, she was a woman. She wanted to study the uh, Jewish rabbinical studies, the Talmud. In order to study them, she had to disguise herself as a man to be taken seriously. Her point of using the word Yentl in the story was that do we as women have to disguise ourselves to be, to be taken seriously? Do we have to present exactly like men in order for people to see that we have the same disease process? And there is an assumption really that that's the only way women will be taken seriously. Well, there was a notion that you know the typical symptoms of angina may not be seen in women and that women may present with more atypical symptoms. Regardless of whether you believe that or not, and I'm gonna show you some data that will make it clear that I don't believe that, but um, women were less likely to have obstructive lesions. So they were, you know, we don't always find the exact same pattern of cardiovascular disease in women as we've seen in men. And so sometimes that in the past was making people say that this is not, you know, they don't have an obstructive lesion, this is not their heart. We now know that it can still be the heart without obstructive lesions. Women nonetheless report more angina in numerous studies that has been shown they're far more symptomatic whether or not they have obstructive lesions. But let's talk about how people present because I do think that there is a notion that women present atypically. And you know, the Virgo study, that study of younger men and younger women, actually we had very limited data about that younger population, so they did ask about the symptoms. And they actually found that 90% of women and 90% of men actually did report chest pain or pressure or tightness or chest discomfort. The only thing that women did differently is they also reported three or more additional symptoms often. It was more likely in women that they would get, expand on that symptom. It wasn't just chest pain or chest pressure, but they might have had other symptoms. The problem was is that it wasn't always seen. So, you know, even patients themselves, there is some notion that heart disease isn't a problem for women because when we ask them why, you know, what was the reason that they didn't think this was their heart in Virgo, men often thought it was a muscle issue and women often thought it was anxiety. So initially that was the problem. When we asked them in this study, what, what made you seek care? You know, they were, women were more likely to be worried about other health problems. Men did think, well, it could be my heart. Maybe I will go and get this checked out. As a result, women had greater delays in getting care. It was more likely for a woman to have a more than a six hour delay in getting themselves some, in some way, shape, and form to the emergency room. Additionally, there was quite a big group of them, at least a third, uh, that did seek out medical care before they came, before the, before the um, myocardial infarction. And it was actually more likely that women would seek out care, but it was more likely that they were told it was not their heart. So it was, again, more frequent that a woman would be told it's not a heart condition compared to a man, and they would find other reasons. And again, remind you that all these people did go on to have an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Now there was a recent study presented at ESC called the Hermes study, how appropriate, because we were in France when it was presented, and they showed the same, same very similar findings in people that went on to have a cardiac cath, people that were reported to have angina, they found that 90% of men and 90% of women reported chest pain or shortness of breath symptoms. So there was truly, and they, this is where they used artificial intelligence. They didn't care what the doctor heard. They had a machine recording everything that the patient described. And if the word chest pain was spoken or shortness of breath, it was recorded by artificial intelligence. And again, they did find that women were more likely to report other symptoms, but when they had an obstructive lesion, they still, 90% of them, did report the chest pain as part of that, that problem. So artificial intelligence, you know, they don't know if it's a, 
a woman or a man. They just hear what's being said. So maybe it's how we're listening to women. And I always say listen to women because they, they probably are telling you something. It is true that the more atypical symptoms were more likely to be seen or reported with women. But again, 90% who went on to have an obstructive lesion did have chest pain. So um, the other study that was also presented at ESC was the high stakes data, and they, though it's from the UK, and they, again, also looked at people report, reporting symptoms and those who went on to have a myocardial infarction and those who did not. And again, women were actually found to be more likely to have the typical symptoms as shown in these sort of um, target curves that you can see the things in red. Um, above the line are the ones that are more likely to be associated with the typical symptoms, the pain in the chest, arm, jaw, dull, heavy, tight pressure, ache, squeezing, crushing, or gripping. And those were the things that they were asked about in addition to the atypical symptoms. But again, women were more likely to report the typical symptoms in those who had a myocardial infarction. There is other sex differences. I know today I don't have a lot of time to go in them, but we know for uh, pa when people are witnessed to have cardiac arrest, it's less likely that women will get CPR. We know if you're less likely to get CPR or less likely to get defibrillated or you ha initiated, the recovery is certainly lower. There's a lot of reasons why people don't do CPR in addition to not knowing how to do CPR. Even those who know CPR are more likely to be scared to initiate it in a woman, mostly because they're worried about hurting a woman or exposing a woman, or what do they do about the breast? And so we are trying to change this. There's, you know, we say that we don't have a mannequin, Annie Doll, even though she has a woman's name, she doesn't look like a woman. And so maybe we need to be teaching on a womankin because that will help us actually make people more comfortable with treating women. Because, you know, as we all know in this room, if you start car CPR, you're more likely to save that person. So we have a lot of education to do to our population at large. So the other question I have for you is, do the guidelines actually apply to women? And I'm just going to briefly touch on this, not to get into microvascular disease too much, but we all, from the 2012 uh, Stable Ischemic Heart Disease Guidelines, we were always looking at for obstructive lesions. And in fact, that was the whole purpose. It's not that you have to read them all, the, the flow diagram, but it was basically, who do we take to the cath lab to find disease? And that overt focus really misled us. And I remember being in medical school learning the other diagram there that is on the left, basically showing that the only way you could have an abnormal test or the only way you could even be symptomatic is if you have an obstructive lesion. And we know that that isn't true. So that's a diagram that needs to be thrown to the wayside. We know from many registry data and many studies, but this is the ACC uh, NCDR cath PCI registry when you compare women to men. You can see that women are less likely to have obstructive lesions compared to men, whether you're talking about stable ischemic heart disease on the top or acute coronary syndrome on the bottom. And yet, women have the worst outcomes, regardless of race. You can see stratified by both of those groups, women have worse outcomes. We showed some of the work that I did with the WISE study in, our, in my control cohort called the Women Take Heart Population, we compared asymptomatic women to women that had evidence of ischemia but no obstructive lesions and found that those people without obstructive lesions were more likely to go on and have adverse cardiovascular events. And this has now been shown again in other data. We don't know if the, you know, the obstructive lesions, you know, are, we're good at those. Cardiologists, especially the interventional cardiologists, they're just plumbers. They'll be mad at me for saying that, but they can open that up and we know what to do with it. The problem is in those who have the small vessel disease, we can't see that in the cath lab necessarily. There's tests we can do to try to tease it out, but it makes it much harder. And perhaps this is one of the potential mechanistic differences between women since we, are, we do see non-obstructive lesions more frequently in women. 
I won't go into Anoka enough, but it, much at all, because it's a whole topic of itself. But Anoka stands for ischemia with no obstructive coronary arteries, and there's a lot of gaps. We still don't know which test best to use. We don't know how to use all our imaging tools or in the cath lab, which one is the gold standard. We also don't know how to treat it entirely. And there's a lot of trials going on. So there's a lot of gaps for us to keep studying women, specifically because this tends to be a disease more often seen in women. I just think the most important thing is to recognize that, again, that the X, XX and XY is in every cell in the body. And there's all kinds of things that are affected by sex chromosomes that affect every organ in the body. The heart would be no different. And so it's important to take these considerations into your thoughts. So I'm just gonna, this might be the only thing you remember is remember that women are not small men and there's a lot we need to know about them. But I am a preventive cardiologist, so I'm gonna just briefly touch on some risk factors that do affect women a little bit more differently than they do men. We know the traditional risk factors, but some of them disproportionately affect women, like diabetes. If you're a diabetic woman, the risk to your heart is much greater than a diabetic man. Even smoking, it's a greater risk to a woman who smokes than a man who smokes for the same number of cigarettes. Physical inactivity, some of my early work we did on fitness is that we showed that the actually the effect of being poor, less fit had greater cardiovascular consequences and mortality consequences. But there are things that are unique to women, like things that happen during pregnancy, things like inflammation, like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, which are more commonly seen in women that are states of inflammation that again, increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. I don't have to show any of you the risk factors in Jamaica, but for myself, I wanted to know what are the most common conditions here. And this is what is projected, the solid lines, but what the targets are, the global targets, of course, are lower. You can see that for women, obesity rates are higher, and as such, diabetes rates are much higher in women. Blood pressure still lower in women, but on the increase. And smoking, fortunately, looks like it's on a decrease uh, for women, not so much for men. We put these things into our risk calculator. We can get a 10-year risk as well as a lifetime risk, which is very helpful. But aside from putting in woman versus man, there's really not much different here. So what are the things that are missing? Or what should we use in addition to that risk calculator? Well, I think that there's a lot of things given to us at pregnancy. Pregnancy is nature's free stress test, essentially. It tells us a lot about women who might be at risk in their future. And these should be part of our history taking. Just in terms of the things that I like to ask about, the adverse pregnancy outcomes, things like preterm delivery, gestational diabetes, any type of hypertension during pregnancy, and fetal growth restrictions, small for gestational age. Those are the things that we have the strongest data to support. The other things, not as much. Um, but 80% of women bear at least one child in their lifetime, and almost a third of them have one of those adverse pregnancy outcomes. So it should be part of our cardiovascular risk assessment. We have lots of great data. This is just one example from Northern Finland because they can follow their population throughout their lifetime. These were all women that delivered in 1966 and any form of hypertension seemed to predict greater cardiovascular events, greater risk of stroke and myocardial infarction, but also greater risk of diabetes and chronic kidney disease as well. The Caliber study was released last year in the UK, and they showed, again, any type of hypertension or preeclampsia was a great predictor of uh, stroke and cardiovascular events. Gestational diabetes as well. This is an elegant study from France looking at all pregnancies in 2007 to 2008 and following them for just seven years. They're still quite young women, and those young women were more likely to have a stroke, myocardial infarction, or angina. So again, we're not talking that these are the people having their events in their 70s. We're talking that this is a predictor of things that can happen really in the next decade, and we're still saying they're quite young women. 
Preterm birth, we did this work and published it last year, showing again that preterm birth was uh, having a baby before 37 weeks was a predictor of cardiovascular events, including stroke. And we propose this as a, a potential mechanistic way. It could be that risk factors ha are already present before people deliver, and there's something turned on during pregnancy, or there's something that is, is announced during pregnancy that puts them at risk later. And there's a lot of work looking at different things. The placenta may be important. Other uh, markers of inflammation may be important. Hopefully it will help us uh, be better able to protect our young women. I don't have enough time to go into about breast cancer and heart disease, and I know you heard a nice talk yesterday about cardio-oncology. I'd just say that, you know, there, there is a connection between the heart disease, between heart disease and breast cancer. The link is quite close, including genetic things as well as cardiac risk factors, as well as the impact of the therapies that people get for breast cancer that can ultimately affect the heart, and they are a group of women that we should be addressing cardiovascular risk. So my approach for women is I do use the risk calculator to assess somebody's risk, but I, t I need more. I need their family history. If they're high risk in America, we know veteran women, for example, are very high risk. Um, if we have a coronary calcium, we'll actually calculate their MESA risk score. Then we use the sex-specific risk factors like the adverse pregnancy outcomes as well as if they have a history of breast cancer. And then if they've gone through menopause, if they're on hormone replacement therapy, all of that matters. The female predominant conditions like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis would be the next piece of information I take in. And I feel like that's where the personalization comes in. We can't do genetics on everyone, nor will genetics change the outcomes right now for everyone. If we're not just asking about sex differences, the easiest thing to ask that treat women a little different than men in a good way, that will help us take better care of our women. So I hope that I've convinced you that, you know, that women have, have worse outcomes for myocardial infarction. And if we just treat according to the guidelines better for women, we can improve a woman's health. The younger women are at the greatest risk, and we still have a lot of work to do to tease out why. The symptoms for angina, I hope I'll convince you that they actually are more typical than we thought. I'm the chair of the chest pain guidelines for the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. And if I have it my way, not that I, you know, reviewers will tell me if I get it my way, but I hope to convince people to stop using that label because of the way it's been misused. Atypical, when my fellow comes and tells me, oh, they have atypical symptoms, they're telling me, this isn't their heart. That is not what the definition of atypical is. It's supposed to be a less typical presentation than normal, but of heart disease in this particular case. I can't get into Anoka or Minoka today about the normal coronary arteries or the non-obstructive lesions, but I do think that it's important to be aware of that, and there's more data coming out about that. And I think the biggest thing we can do is assess cardiovascular risk in both our men and women and try to prevent heart disease before it happens, because as you all know, more than 80% of heart disease is preventable if we can just address the risk factors. So I'm gonna leave you with the wise words of my husband. There's just so much more to understanding woman, and he put this out on Halloween to say that was him, that he was still waiting for me to get ready. So again, thank you, thank you for having me here. So Dr. Gulati has to uh, leave for her plane after this, so are there some questions for her? It, this topic was so important to me because I see a lot of women who come in who have had untreated coronary disease for many years and oftentimes it's because we're not expecting them to have it. And so when you're saying, okay, we need to look further, they'll tell you, oh, but my doctor said it wasn't my heart, so why you want to check? So. It's really important also because I noticed you said the statistics in Jamaica showed that women were more likely to die from, or, or were more likely to die from um, CVA yeah. than coronary artery disease. And I wonder how much of it is the exact same thing 
in that a CVA is, the presentation is not missed. You know, you, if your face is drooping or if you have a hemiplegia, it's clearly a stroke. If you come in with your chest pain and we think, oh, it's just gas, or oh, you might be a little anxious, how many of our actual coronary artery disease, acute MI patients are we missing? And therefore, it's not factoring into our death rates from CVD. So it's, it's and it surprises me, to be honest, when I read the statistic that women are more likely to have a stroke, especially given the diabetes prevalence here. Exactly. It was actually and surprising. I would have thought that, you know, there would be more cardiovascular disease. And I'm certain that they're missing it. And I'm certain that, you know, again, I, I, I would say that, you know, we miss women um, because we focus on so many other issues and we're not educating. We, I think one of the things we have to do is also educate our population. If we educate our population that they're at risk, they will start asking you, but is my heart okay? I heard it's the number one killer. You know, I, in, this, in this particular society where there's lots of diabetes, lots of obesity, actually way more obesity. I was surprised to read the statistics for men versus women. Uh, on obesity, it's almost double in women, which is not what it is in the U.S. They're pr relatively speaking, just a little bit more in women, and the hypertension. For all those reasons, there must be heart disease. But we're f probably they're dying from other things. Maybe they're living with issues, and then the stroke is just the final story because these are mortality data. It isn't what people are necessarily living with. But I think there's a lot left for us to do and I you know I think in a society where there is so much so many risk factors as there is in the United States we there they, we have to be more proactive because our health care dollars can only go so far and we could be more better at prevention and educating people the impact of these adverse health issues and trying to deal with that I think that's the most probably the best way of our dollar using our dollars Quick question. Um, there's Salim Yusuf's favorite, famous words, if a woman lives like a man, she'll die like a man. So heart disease is, in women is there. But I just want, is there any data anywhere that suggests that women um, with heart disease are better cared for by women cardiologists? <laughs> Could there be an intersection between card heart disease in women and women in cardiology? Well, thank you for that question. Um, I'd like to say that we should have more women cardiologists, of course. And I do think women in cardiology, not exclusively, because there's been many men at the front of the battle line with us. But I do think the focus in making sure research and inclusion of women in trials has largely happened because of some great women leaders. But to answer your question, there is actually data that treatment, um, when there's women involved in the care, that women do do better. It mostly comes from emergency room data, so it's not specifically cardiologists. But in the emergency room, female physicians tend, there is data, again, there's lots of variables that they couldn't control for. But in that study that got a lot of press headlines, female physicians were taking better care of women and they were having equal outcomes. Now, where, where when it was men and they were in a emergency room with more women, then the differences between the sexes mattered less. So it means that we must be sharing some knowledge with our colleagues. But specifically about cardiologists, I don't think we have that data. I have a question. <clears throat> Excellent talk. Uh, but uh, uh, recently, uh, within the last several years, in the software for EKG, when we have uh, 12 lead, uh, there is frequently this phrase, feminine pattern. You can see STT changes uh, uh, or inversion or depression ant anteriorly, and it's fe feminine pattern. Um, and then, uh, so you have a comment on that? Uh, if I see something like this in a man, I'm obviously very concerned. With the ladies, uh, I treat them the same way. Uh, we are as, as aggressive as, because what we found that particularly in the, in the younger um, uh, ladies, uh, if you miss something, it's, it's a disaster. So we treat the same, the, the same way everybody, although I, I must uh, admit that in the old days there was this bias that the ladies, whatever, uh, they outlive us and, and, and stuff. 
but, but with this uh, EKG feminine pattern, I'm always very skeptical. Uh, I, I wouldn't even, why is this feminine pattern? Uh, the, do you have any comment? Uh, so, yeah, it's two different systems. I will say the Marquette system rarely gives that, whereas the Phillips system, I've seen that uh, in the report all the time, and I just cross it out. It, it's incorrect. And I, I think it's a difference between the two systems more than, I mean, we have to read our own EKGs and decide if these things are abnormal or normal. And, um, but I have seen the same thing. And hopefully, the problem with that, though, of course, is if an emergency room, someone who maybe isn't as equipped to read the EKG or you know as trained as a cardiologist, they might just believe that and decide it's not something they need to call about and not activate a cath lab. Hopefully, we're not missing STEMIs, cause, but you, as you saw, even where we know the, that a STEMI has occurred, we are still treating women differently. Just a question, Dr. Galati, thanks for your wonderful talk. Thank and thanks for make, making mention of lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. I am one of the predominantly female rheumatologists, I'm not a cardiologist. And um, in our world, we've long, of course, recognized this cardiovascular risk, but um, our people have often sh stopped short of giving us precise guidelines to use on the front line. So I wondered what your practice was when the Birmingham scores don't work and that you really feel like um, you're not quite sure if there should be a threshold or where, what the intensity should be um, if you use statin therapy. Yeah, so it is, that's a hard question because we just don't have, we have a lot of data that they have worse outcomes, but we don't know what we, when we should be addressing them. What we do with our rheumatology colleagues is we have all those patients, every patient that has an inflammatory disorder, we actually have them sent to a common clinic where we assess the risk. We don't have any data. We know they have more inflammation. So what we try to look for is do they have more risk factors? We know that it could be inflammation. It could be also a consequence of the medications they need that are to treat their diseases. And so we don't know which one is more important. but. Assessing cardiovascular risk because they have more, they may have more diabetes. They do often have hypertension earlier, and assessing the risk at least is a starting point. And then you can decide about other testing. But I think having a joint uh, pathway between rheumatology and cardiology, or whoever's your preventive team. I don't think it should fall on the rheumatologist, but if we can be partners in their patient's care, it really does make a difference. And I think we need more data to your point of like, yeah, we, right now we, it isn't in the ASCVD risk score, and I don't know if it will be, but how do, wh what should we do, the timing of it? Right now, I, I, we don't entirely know. We just know they're the higher risk group, so let's see them early and keep reassessing the risk. Hey, Dr. Galati, thanks for that. Um, I think you answered most of the questions. So in, in your slide that says my approach, if you had, say, say um, no rheumatoid, but if you had those risk factors that you looked at, are you, are you, is there, are you advocating a much more, uh, you have a young lady, 35 years old, who has some of those um, issues? Are you saying to see them more often? What do you do? do you, are you doing a calcium score? Are you, what are you saying about the follow-up? So is the question, what would I? What's the approach? That my approach? Yeah, yeah. So you've, you've taken a good physical, family history, rheumatoid, lupus. What are you advocating for follow-up? Okay. So in general, I use the ASCVD risk score. Unless they have a coronary calcium score or unless I order one, then I use the MESA risk score because the MESA, of course, you know, involves the coronary calcium score as well. So if I have that information or if I decide they need that information, then I will add it to, I will get it done and then recalculate their score. I use that every year when they come because risk factors change depending on how frequently, if I'm the one monitoring them, if it's, you know, I'm often seeing people both for hypertension and for cholesterol. Um, so if they, but I usually say, if they're not going to address it, their primary care physician, 
then they need to come back at least once a year so that I can reassess it. If they're higher risk, you know, we'll make decisions. We have to individualize it for the, the person in front of you about the different things that we would do. I, in general, don't necessarily repeat coronary calcium scores. Uh, the data on that isn't that strong. Um, but I do it sometimes at a baseline, especially for the intermediate risk or the people that look low risk by their ASCVD risk calculator, but have a strong family history. Yeah, but, but I, if, if I remember, the ASCVD risk factor wouldn't help with somebody, wasn't recommended for somebody that young. It, it, it what? Was not recommended for young people. Oh, yeah, for the, oh, sorry, for the youngest for young, people. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah, so under the age of, you know, the, under the age of 35, we don't have good data about risk score calculation. They don't end up in the calculator. So that for that population, for the pregnant women, you know, we consider all of those things, those adverse pregnancy outcomes, that we take a full pregnancy history, um, and that's basically how we decide if they're at high risk. What we also do for anyone with, who comes from our ob gyne clinics is they all get, obviously they get their blood pressure checked, but they also get their cholesterol checked, and then we make a determination of their risk. We don't use the risk calculator, we just kind of use the whole, is there any risk factors present? And work on with them on their, you know, that this is a lifetime issue. We feel, we just don't have good data yet, but I do think that what we communicate to the young women who have just delivered their babies, in order for them to be there for their children, they need to be proactive, they need to be engaged. If there's dietary stuff, lifestyle stuff, and usually they're highly engaged if you get them at the right time. It's always a question. You can't talk to them right after they deliver because their only focus is on the baby. So we've been trying to tie it in to their six-week visit because they're usually coming to their OB, and then we have them come and see us.